Word of God comes to us today from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 7. We are continuing to walk through the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, beginning at verse 31. We hear a, a story about a man uh, that Jesus heals. It says, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis. There, some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, somebody say, away from the crowd. Away from the crowd. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ear. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Lord, have mercy. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be open. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be unto God. You may be seated. As you take your seats, help me put a title on this sermon. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to be delivered. Find one other person and tell them, I want to be delivered. Amen. A few months ago, I was talking with a friend of mine who had been making a lot of purchases online on the internet. He and his wife, they purchased many of their household supplies, many of their clothing items and other things they needed. They oftentimes purchased them on the internet uh, or online. They, they normally would then have these packages dropped off on, on their doorstep or on their porch and they picked them up when they would arrive at home. And he was talking to me about some orders that he had made that he had not gotten yet and he was anxiously awaiting their arrival but they had not come. And so he contacted the, the merchant and they assured him that the items that had been ordered had been delivered. But he wasn't convinced. And so he continued to, to research and investigate. And finally, he found out that some police had arrested some men in his neighborhood who had been following the UPS truck. Literally following the truck and waiting to take some packages, take deliveries off of folks' doorsteps. What they didn't realize is that some people had cameras on their porches that caught them right in the act. My friend was upset at what was happening in his neighborhood, but he was also embarrassed because he had argued the merchant down and said, y'all didn't deliver my stuff. But what happened, church, is that what he ordered was delivered. It was just stolen before he could fully enjoy it. And here's what, here's what we've got to understand, that this is oftentimes what happens in your life and in mine, is that God has given us everything that we need. That's what the, the Scriptures say. We have everything that we need for life and godliness. In Ephesians chapter 1, when it talks about our salvation, it says we've been blessed with every gift or every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. What that means is at the point of salvation, God has given you all you need to make it in this life. But what's happening is that there is an enemy of our souls, the devil, Satan, the adversary, who oftentimes steals what God has placed in us. That's why the Bible says the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You see, God has, has poured into us all that we need to make it in this world and in this life. But the enemy of our souls wants to take what God has delivered to us. You see, just because God has delivered it to you doesn't mean the enemy won't try to steal it off your doorstep. It, it doesn't mean that the enemy won't try to take what God has promised unto you. Has, has anybody ever, ever felt the devil trying to steal your joy? Anybody ever sensed the devil trying to steal your peace? You, you woke up and you thought it's going to be a good day. You were feeling good. You were moving in the right direction. But then all of a sudden, issue over issue over issue began to pile up in your life uh, and a heaviness came over you. That's because, brothers and sisters, the enemy of our soul wants to take what God has already delivered unto us. But I believe that there are some folk in the house today who, will, who are bold enough and strong enough to say, devil, you can't have what God delivered to me. And you can, look, you can't have it without a fight. 
Look, my, 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 my peace is not up for grabs. My, my joy is not for sale. My, my family is not available. And anything you try to take from me, you've got to fight on your hands because God has granted it unto me. You see, my sermon title today is I Want to Be Delivered. And that could, that could mislead somebody because you might think I'm just talking about getting delivered initially, but I'm talking about a continuous process, a continuous mindset. Because somebody here understands it's not enough just to get delivered, but what God is calling us to is a continuous lifestyle of walking in our freedom. You see, the enemy would want nothing more than for you to be set free only to walk or fall back into what God set you free from. But Paul says in Galatians 5.1, he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He's saying Christ did not set us free so we could go back into where we've come from, but he set us free so that we could walk in freedom eternally. I want to walk in faith daily so that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I, I want to walk in, in freedom daily so that when I run up against a trial, I can say if God is for me, who can be against me? God has called us not just to get delivered, but to walk daily in our deliverance. The, the verb to be is, is a, a continuous action verb. It, it's, it's stating a process that not is only for a moment, but is continual. Someone may say, well, Pastor, I, I don't need to be delivered. I'm good. I'm, I'm good, Pastor. But, but the Bible says that in Galatians chapter 1, Jesus has died to deliver us from the present age. He's died to deliver us from what we face in this world. And then when Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, he says, this is how you ought to pray. Lead us not into temptation. But do what? deliver us from evil. You see, we all need deliverance in the house. Some, some need to be delivered from, from mindsets or from certain activities. Some need to be delivered from pride or from guilt. We all need to be delivered from our sin. And, and if we're really honest, sometimes we need to be delivered from ourselves. Uh, uh, Y'all ain't even got to say amen. I, I know, I know this is right. Some, you, you've been there where you, you've been trying to figure out uh, who was causing the problem. You've been trying to figure out who else you could blame until finally you had to look in the mirror and say, I'm the one that needs work. I'm the one that needs to act differently. I'm the one that needs to speak differently. God, will you help me break free from myself? Uh, I know I'm not gonna get too many. I'm not get too many amens on that right there. I got a few folks in the choir stand who who will say, "I hear you, Pastor." But 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 sometimes we gotta we've gotta be delivered even from ourselves. It's not enough just to get delivered, but I I need to walk in my deliverance. That's why that's why we are a church that seeks to focus on discipleship, because a Sunday sermon by itself is not enough. You, you can walk out of here on an emotional or spiritual high on a Sunday morning, but discipleship is the daily process of following Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says, he says, if anybody's going to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me daily. This is not a once a week, once a month thing. This is a daily walk that we might experience the power of the Lord. In, in the text for today, we find a man who is deaf and mute being healed. The story continues to highlight the healing power of Jesus Christ, but in it, we also learn some lessons about deliverance. To be delivered means to be set free, rescued from danger or trial. We learn some lessons about the power of God and how it can set you and I free, how it can keep us free, or how it can even keep us in the middle of a trial that we're facing. The first thing that God wants to say to us today is this. Deliverance is available in every area of your life. Turn to your neighbor and say, every area. 
You see, throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has been healing and, and delivering people. We've seen him heal a man with leprosy. We've seen him heal a paralyzed man, a man who had been demon-possessed, a girl who was dead, a woman who had been sick for 12 years. And in each of these cases, there is one primary issue that Jesus is asked to deal with. But here, for the first time in the Gospel of Mark, one person comes to Christ with two different issues. He comes with two different issues. And, and, and listen, his predicament, number one, reminds us this, that many of us have a number of things to bring to Jesus, if, if we're real honest about it. There are multiple areas in our lives that require the power of the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, I got issues. Come on, come on. I know, I know, you, I know you ain't want to say it. But if, if you're really being honest today, if I'm really being honest, I say I got issues with an S on the end, right, right? We, we want to sometimes make it seem like, well, I just got, I just got one thing I got to work on. No, we got, a, we got a few things in our lives that need work. And, and, and so, and so here, here, this, this man comes and he's got issues. You see, the other folks earlier, one guy, he was paralyzed. That's all we know. The other woman, she had an issue of blood for 12 years. That's all we know. But here, this man, he comes, he's deaf, and he can hardly speak. And what's powerful, church, is that his issues are interconnected. You see, part of the reason why he can't speak well is because he can't hear well. And so Jesus understands, I got to deal with both of these issues in order for him to be whole because of the way they are connected. And sometimes we only want to bring one of our issues to the Lord, but the Lord is saying, I got to deal with all your issues because you're never going to be whole. If I only deal with your anger, but I don't deal with your fear, you're still going to act out. If, if I only deal with your pride, but not your lust, you're still going to be in trouble. And so I need you to bring all of it to me so that I can handle all of your issues. You see, the good news is that Jesus does not just heal one of these, this man's issues, but he heals them both. Jesus did not die on the cross to set us free from some of our sins. He died to set us free from all of our sins. That means he wants to handle our fear and our pride, our doubt and our temptation, our racism and our oppression, our envy and our anger. When it comes to deliverance, we do not serve an either or God. We serve a both and God. And he says today, I want to deliver you out of all of your issues. God says, it's not out of my reach to handle everything. I was, I, was, I was shopping at a, at a store recently, and, and when I had made a selection, and I went up, I went up to uh, the cash register, and I brought up a shirt, and I placed it there, and I was getting ready to buy it, and the, and the cashier said, she said, oh, oh, no, you got to go get another one of these. And I said, wow, what's going on? She said, we got to buy one, get one free. I didn't realize. I said, oh, I said, hey, I like that. I didn't realize. I didn't realize there was a sale going on. And she said, she said, don't come back up unless you bring some more of these up with you. Because she wanted me to understand the kind of deal uh, that I was going to get. And so, and so there, there I went and I got a few more because I realized there was a nice little discount I was going to get. But, but here's, here's the connection I want to make. That, that part, of, part of what God is saying to us, he's saying, don't just come and bring one issue, but come and bring them all. He's saying, he's saying, come and lay them all at my feet. Because when you lay them all at my feet, you'll get more than you ever imagined. He's saying, I want to handle every concern in your life. Don't just bring your fears. Don't just bring your doubts. But bring your hurts. Bring your heartaches. Bring your struggles bring your temptations, bring your diseases, even bring your demons, says the Lord, and I'm able to handle every, every ailment. Jesus says, deliverance is available in every area of your life. The second thing this, this text lifts up to you and I, church, is that deliverance often happens away from the crowd. Say away from the crowd. 
It often happens away from the crowd. Look at what the text says. At the beginning of verse 33, it says, after Jesus took him aside, away from the crowd. It indicates that Jesus was not looking for some kind of glory to himself in this healing in front of the masses, but he ministered to this man where nobody else could see. A few weeks ago, I preached a sermon only at the 8 o'clock service uh, entitled, The Best Me I Can Be. And it was a sermon where I talked about when Jesus said to his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. You see, Jesus is saying, I need you sometimes to step away from everybody and everything in your life in order to get you alone with me that you might hear what you could not hear before. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You ever, been, you ever been in the house when it's quiet and you're the only one in there and you can hear stuff you ain't never heard before? Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I didn't even know the sink was dripping like that. <laughs> I didn't know the toilet was running because when you're quiet and you're by yourself, you can hear some things you never heard before. And so Jesus says, look, sometimes I got to get you away from the crowd and away from everybody else, away from the distractions so you can really hear who I am and what I want to do in your life. He's highlighting the fact that if we keep moving toward distractions, we'll never walk into our destiny. We live in a world full of distractions, and oftentimes some distractions cannot be avoided. There's some things that are going to come in your life and distract you. But the question is, do we move toward the distraction, or do we move around it and continue on the path to our destiny? See, in my role as, as the pastor of this church, every day I get a number of requests that come across my desk every single day. And while many of them are urgent, watch this, not all of them are important to me and the mission of this church. Somebody say, well, Pastor, can you, can you come down here to this event? Can you go over here to this event? And they may be urgent. They may be important requests, but not to the mission of this church. And so if I continue to follow every distraction, I'll never get to the place where God has destined me to be. This church won't be where God has called it to be. And so we got to learn how to move away from the distractions to move toward our destiny. You see, the crowd is a great place for distractions. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Distractions fester. They, they, they grow in the crowd because everybody has their own agenda. I, I've told you before that everybody in your life has an agenda for your life. And unless you make up in your mind, I'm going to follow God's agenda for my life, before you know it, you're going to follow somebody else's agenda for you that may not be in alignment with what God wants to do through you. Some, some folks wake up and they got plans for you, but you got to have plans for yourself so that you can tell them, no, nah, that's not on my agenda today. That's not what God is calling me to do today. I know that's what you want me to do, but I got to be on God's agenda and I can't be distracted by everybody else. Now, now watch what it says. It says Jesus took him aside. The brother was deaf, so he couldn't hear. Jesus couldn't tell him, come over here with me. Jesus had to physically grab him and pull him away from the crowd. He had to lead him away from the crowd. And there are some areas in your life and in mine where, where the Lord has been speaking to us, but we ain't been listening. And so what he's literally going to have to do is he's going to have to pull you away from the crowd. He's going to have to pull you away from those things and those people that are hindering you from your purpose. You see, the crowd likes to tell you what God can't do. The crowd likes to bring up old stuff from your past. The, the, the crowd likes you as you are because if you change, that means they're going to have to change or they're going to have to find somebody else to hang out with. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And so the crowd, the, crowd, the crowd really doesn't want to see you change and grow because they would rather you stay just like you are. The crowd favors the sensational over the transformational. 
they rather see you act a fool and, and put you on YouTube than for you to be transformed. See, see, they, they'll catch you. They'll catch you when you're acting crazy, but they won't catch you when God is changing your life and turning you around because they favor the sensational over the transformational. Yesterday, we had the community day, and we had hundreds of folks from the community out here being blessed and, and being impacted. Uh, but if somebody got shot yesterday, KDKA would have been up in here. WTAE would have been around, and, and WPXI would have made sure to have some cameras in the neighborhood because they favor the sensational. The crowd wants to see the sensational, but because we had folks in here getting impacted by the gospel and getting strengthened in their relationship, because we had praise and worship going on outside and transformation was taking place in people's hearts, the crowd was nowhere to be found. I don't know about you, but I didn't, I didn't see no, no trucks coming up the street with TV initials on them. Why? Because the crowd favors the sensational, not the transformational. The crowd likes you as long as you meet their needs. But as soon as you start focusing on your own growth and development, the crowd may not have any more use for you. And I want you to understand today that oftentimes your deliverance will not take place in the crowd. Jesus takes this man away from the crowd, and then deliverance can begin. This might be your, your quiet time of, of devotion. This might be your personal time in prayer. This might be your accountability with, with your partners in, in, in your relationship with the Lord. The question is, how do you get away from the crowd? What, what do you do? to get away from the crowd. And in your life, what places is Jesus trying to take you aside? And then the question is this, why are we resisting? We got to get to the heart of the matter. Why are we resisting when the Lord is trying to pull us away from the crowd? Is it that we become so comfortable in that place that we're not ready to move where God has called us to be? And so you see, God says, in order for deliverance to take place, I got to pull you away from the crowd. God told Noah, I need you to build an ark. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. He said, I, I want to I wanna deliver you. I want to start something new through you. And if you get too caught up on everybody else, you won't be on the boat. God told Abraham, go to the place that I will show you. Abraham could have said, well, I like it right here where I am. But God was saying, I've got to get you to a different place so you can see some, th some different things and you can move in a different direction. God told Esther, go in and see the king. And you can't do what everybody else does. Here's what you got to understand. Where you are going, everybody can't go. Come on, tell your neighbor, everybody can't go. They can't, everybody can't go with you. And, and, and I'm sorry, I know we want to bring everybody with us, and, and we want to bring the whole hood with us when we go. Everybody can't go with you where God is calling you to go. And so sometimes you got to be comfortable enough to say, you know what, I got to leave some folks behind before I get left behind. You see, either... Either, either we will leave some folks behind or we will wake up one day and realize that we are part of the folks that got left behind. You see, God says deliverance often happens away from the crowd. Then, then thirdly here in the text, and finally, I'm almost done, but, but I got to point out this to us, that deliverance is not always pretty. Turn to your neighbor and say, it ain't pretty. Come on, tell them it ain't pretty. Look at what happens here. It, it says that, that after Jesus put his, fing in, his fingers in the man's ears, he spit on his tongue. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Woo! It says, it, says, it says he spit, right, and then he put his hands on the man's tongue. Now, somebody can read that and say, oh, that meant Jesus was just spitting on the ground over here, and then he touched the man's tongue. No, nah, this is meant to help us understand. Jesus spits on his hand, and then he reaches out. <laughs> Woo! Some of y'all, if that, if that had been you, you'd have said, no, nah, Jesus. <laughs> Not today. You see, the, the use... 
the use of, of saliva, it was not uncommon in, in healing in the first century, but, but to our modern ears, this sounds downright disgusting. <laughs> disgusting. And can you imagine, uh, can you imagine if it didn't work? You, you sitting there with somebody else's spit on your tongue. Lord have mercy. Now, in chapter 8, in chapter 8, a couple of weeks from now, we, we, we may see this, this other healing take place where Jesus spits on the ground and, and he, he opens the eyes of a blind man, right? But what's interesting is that man was blind, so he couldn't see what Jesus was doing. This brother is deaf. His eyes wide open. So he can see Jesus go to spit on his hand and then start coming. Lord, have mercy. He starts coming toward him. But this brother says, I want to be delivered. And if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. You see, some of us, some of us, mm, we want, we want pretty deliverance. We, we, want, we want the movie ender, ending deliverance. We want, we want happily ever after. We want, we want, I just want to come to church one time and everything be all good. Or I, I just want one counseling session to fix it, right? We, we've been, I've been having issues uh, for, for 20 years, but I just want the pastor to fix it in 60 minutes. 30 minutes, that's all I need, Pastor, all I need. No, sometimes it's not going to be that easy. It's not going to be that pretty. We, we want one prayer to make everything all right, or we want one check to come in the mail and solve all our problems. But God says sometimes deliverance is not pretty. Yeah, yeah I can set you free in an instant, but sometimes it's going to take prayer and fasting. Yeah, sometimes it's going to take 40 days in the wilderness. Yeah, sometimes it's going to require some perseverance. Sometimes you're going to have to go through things you never thought you would go through. Sometimes it's going to take some spit on your tongue. But God says, how bad do you want it? Mm. You see, if you, if you want it bad enough, you'll move away from the crowd. If you want it bad enough, you'll put on the full armor of God. If you want it bad enough, you'll persevere in the desert. You'll fight for your family. You'll fight for your community. It may not be pretty, but it's worth it. Come on, tell your neighbor it's worth it. Moses, Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Because it ain't always pretty, but it's worth it. Hannah spent years praying for a child. The Bible says that Hannah was barren, and she wanted to give birth to a child. And when you read 1 Samuel chapter 1, it says year after year. It don't say she, she prayed for a couple months or a couple weeks. The Bible says year after year, Hannah prayed, and she went up to the temple. Why? Because it ain't pretty, but it's worth it. David spent years running from Saul, even after God had called him to be king. He knew the anointing was on his life. He knew who he was called to be. He just was waiting to be able to walk into his destiny, but it took him year after year. Here David is hiding in a cave. He's the king. He's been anointed to be the king, but he's hiding in a cave. Why? Because it ain't always pretty, but it's worth it. Jonah was in the belly of a whale. Why? Because it ain't always pretty, but it's worth it. And the prime example, church, that it ain't always pretty is a man named Jesus who died on a cross for your sins and for my sins. Thorns in his head, nails in his hands. Uh, he had lashes on his back. He had, he had, he had, he had been pierced in his side. Why? Because it's not pretty, but it's worth it. He'd been mocked by men, laid in a borrowed tomb. He was dead on Friday. He was dead on Saturday. But on Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand, and he got up as a sign that deliverance is available. No matter how hard it gets, no matter what you've been through, deliverance is available for you. You see, when Jesus got up off the cross, he had defeated every power of the enemy. He had overcome. 
And he wanted us to understand that it's not always going to be pretty. But it's always worth it. Jesus spits on his hand, touches this man's tongue. And the Bible says, then he looked up to heaven, which is where his power came from. You see, if, if you really want to walk in deliverance, you can no longer try to walk in your own strength. I need a couple more amens on that. Because we, we, are, we are notorious for trying to do things in our own strength. Uh, we, we, we try so often to do things in our own power. But the Bible says that Jesus, after he had touched the man's tongue, he looked up to heaven and he let out a sigh of relief. And then he said, be opened, because he realized where his power was coming from. And there's got to be somebody here who really wants to walk in freedom, who really wants to walk in deliverance and can say, you know what, my power is not coming from me, but it comes from the Almighty God. And when I learn how to rely on Him, when I learn how to really trust in Him, when I throw aside all of my crutches and all of my handicaps, all of the things I use to try to get me through, then and only then will I walk in the fullness of God's deliverance for my life. It may not be easy. It may not come how I want it. It may not not come when I want it. It's not always going to be pretty, but it's worth it. Jesus touched the man's tongue, and the Bible says his ears were opened, and he began to speak plainly. You see, he then began to understand that even though it wasn't pretty, God moved in my life. No cross, no crown. No test, no testimony. And God oftentimes says in our lives, when you're in the middle of a struggle or a trial, there might be great turmoil, great difficulty that you face. But don't give up. Because if you faint not, the Bible says that you will reap. You see, the harvest is never in question. The question is only whether or not we will persevere. Somebody ought to say amen. I said the harvest is never in question. The harvest is guaranteed. The harvest is for sure. The only question is, will we persevere in the middle of the struggle? Will we persevere when it gets ugly in the process. Come on, there's somebody here who can say, Pastor, I've been in some things and it, it, it's, been, it's been rough. It's been difficult. It, it, it's, even, it's even gotten ugly sometimes, but I had to believe that God was still at work. I had to believe that God didn't give me a spirit of fear. I had to believe that God didn't bring me this far to leave me. I had to believe that God was, was able to do exceeding abundantly of all that I could ask or think. I had to believe that if God is for me, who can be against me? I had to believe that if I fainted not, I would reap. And so God says to us today, he says to us today, deliverance is available. It's available in every area of our lives. We got to be willing, though, to step away from the crowd and trust that even when it's not pretty, He's working for our good. Anybody here can, can testify that, yeah, I've been there, Pastor. I've been through some, some dark nights. I've been through some rough days. I've been through some trials and tribulations. But when I kept the faith and when I continued to press on, God brought me to a place where I never even imagined. The Bible says he'll bring you into a spacious place. And look, I, I just need a couple more folks who can testify this morning because your testimony is what's going to encourage somebody else. There's somebody else who's sitting here this morning said, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know how much more I got. I don't know how much more I can deal with. But God says, look at the testimonies around you. Look at the folks who are witnesses to what God is able to do. God says, I'm able. I'm able to do more than you could 
could ever ask or think. The question is, how bad do we want it? I want to be delivered. I don't just want to have an emotional experience. I don't just want to feel good on one day. But I want to walk in the deliverance that God promises. And I don't want the enemy to keep coming on my doorstep and taking what belongs to me. Come on, I, I need some believers in the house who can say, I'm not going to let the enemy have what God promised to me. I want it all back. I want everything back. I want my peace. I want my joy. I want my faith. I want my power. I want the strength of the Lord in my life. And devil, you no longer have power over me. I want to be delivered. Listen, the enemy wants nothing more than for you to walk out of here to feel good for a moment. And then on Tuesday, around about Wednesday, to fall right back into what the Lord has brought you out of. But you got to make up in your mind that right now is the moment. That to, this is the day. This is, come on, tell somebody, this is the day. This is the day that, that, that I'm going to walk in the newness of life. I'm going to step out on faith in accordance with what God has done in me. That's good news. That's good news. Come on, say right now. Right now is the moment. Right now is the moment. 